Evaluating the curl operation on the H field, we get what's shown here. And again, all the partial derivatives with respect to y and z are equal to 0. So these all go away, since the fields do not change in those directions. And since the wave is z-polarized, then the right side of Ampere's law must be epsilon dEz dt. That will give us an electric field in the z direction, which means that for the left side of the equation, we must also have a z component. And therefore, we can only have this term. So this one is also going to be 0 for our z-polarized wave. So I can put in here dhy dx. Now we have a z component on both sides of our equation. And so actually now we can simplify this. dhy dx is equal to epsilon dez dt. So this is the second equation that we want to solve in order to model our plane wave. So now we have two equations and two unknowns, EZ and HY. Now if we're going to use a digital computer to solve these two equations we've come up with, we need to divide the region of space over which we want to solve Ampere's and Faraday's law into a discrete grid. Using digital computers, we will only be able to solve for the two unknowns at discrete positions in space across the grid. So here is our continuous space across x. And then to keep things simple, we're going to assume a regular grid where we have the same distance between each location where we solve for the unknowns. Let's call each of these positions i, i plus 1, i plus 2, and so forth. And we can get i minus 1. And let's say the distance between each of these is delta x. So each of these delta x regions corresponds to one grid cell of our model. Let's also pick one of our field components. Let's say at each of these positions, these i, i plus 1, i plus 2 locations, we're going to be solving for ez. So we store the values of ez at each of these positions, and we can store all these values in an array of numbers. Let's first consider Ampere's law. We want to solve dhy dx is epsilon dez dt. We want to solve this at each of the i, i plus 1, i plus 2 locations in space. Ampere's law here tells us that we can evaluate how ez changes over time at each of these positions as long as we can solve for dhy dx at the same positions. But how, why, how might we evaluate the partial derivatives of hy with respect to space, with respect to x? Let's start by considering how we would evaluate dhy dx at position i. We can write this as dhy dx at position i. I'm going to put a bar here that helps us to separate out the value we want to evaluate, dhy dx, and the location where we want to evaluate it, this i here. In the plot shown here, I'm using the y-axis now to represent an hy value rather than ez as on the previous slide. Intuitively, dhy dx is equal to the slope of hy at position i. Let's think about how we can calculate the slope of hy at position i. We need at least two values of hy at different locations in order to estimate a slope. So then, as one example, if we take a value of hy to the right of position i and subtract the value of hy at position i and then divide by the distance between them, this is one way to estimate the slope of hy at position i. Now we can use a value of hy to the right of position i, but we should be careful about how far to the right we go. 
This is because at position i plus 1 here, that already gets us to the next location in our grid where we want to evaluate the same, the same term, dhy dx. So let's just take a value of hy that is half the distance to the next grid point, or uh, delta x over 2 away. If we do this, then we can estimate dhy dx at position i is going to be about equal to hy at i plus 0.5 minus hy at position i and divide by the distance between so that's divided by delta x over 2. So we'd have to go up here and say evaluate have these va in our stored in our computer. So this would be hy at i plus 0.5 and this would be hy at i. This is called forward differencing. Alternatively, we could use a neighboring value to the left. So here we would have hy position i, and if we go delta x over 2 away to the left, we can get the value hy i minus 0.5. And then if we use these two values to estimate the slope at position i, we get about hyi minus hyi minus 0.5, all divided by delta x over 2. And this is called backward differencing. As a last example, we could take two neighboring values one on either side of i. So here, this would be delta x over 2 away, and this would be delta x over 2 away. Now we have dy dx at position i is about equal to hy i plus 0.5 minus hy i minus 0.5 divided by delta x, because these are two are delta x over 2 in both directions, so the total distance between them is delta x. And this is called central differencing. We could even estimate the derivative of hy at position i by using more than just two neighboring points. But for now, let's just see how well these estimates work. How accurate are these? Well, if we can develop a mathematical expression for hy at specific points in space, then we can use that expression to evaluate the derivative of hy at that position. It turns out that we can use what's called a Taylor series expansion to calculate dhy dx at position i. Let's start with forward differencing. Using a Taylor series expansion, we can predict the value of hy at position i plus a half from a known value of hy at position i. So we're trying to calculate this value by starting with hy at position i. And in order to do that, we need to also know all derivatives of hy at position i. First derivative, second derivative, third derivative terms here. We can see that this expression has a dhy dx term at position i, which means that if we solve for this term, we'll have an expression that we can compare to the equation that we just derived intuitively. So just by moving the first term on the left to the right side of the equation and moving this second term here over to the left, side of the equation, and then dividing the whole equation by delta x over 2 here, 
we're going to be able to solve for this term. So I've shown that here. We've solved for this term. This term now shows up over here, and we've divided the whole equation by delta x over 2. So you'll see here we used to have it squared. Now it's not squared anymore. 3 and it's down to 2. So this second equation here is equal to the expression that we intuitively derived earlier for forward differencing. Uh, this is what we had before, except now that there are now there are extra terms than compared to what we had earlier. So this means we can now say that if we approximate the derivative of hy at position i as just being this first term, then the error we get from doing this is equal to the remainder terms that we've dropped. The largest remainder term that we've dropped approaches zero as delta x approaches zero. You can see that here. This one has a delta x term. So as this space increment, as delta x, as the distance between our field components in the grid reduces, then the error term reduces, the largest error term in our series here, reduces at the same rate. So putting all this together, we can write dhy dx at position i is hy i plus 0.5 minus hyi over de delta x over 2 plus the remainder term is on the order of delta x. So this is short notation for the remainder term. In other words, forward differencing is first order accurate. In order to see how accurate backwards differencing is, we can use a Taylor series expansion where we predict the value of h, y, i minus a half from a known value of h, y, i, as well as all the derivatives of h, y at position i. This is the same expression as what we just had for forward differencing, but here we just have some minus signs. Spend a minute going through the same process as what we just followed for forward differencing, but now try to calculate how accurate backwards differencing is. Remember, for backwards differencing, we estimated that the partial derivative is hyi minus hyi minus 0.5 over delta x over 2.